Hello, let's talk about Etruscan art and culture and start to introduce the influence that Etruscan art had on Rome, that they influenced a lot of cultures that we've been studying as well. So I've included a couple of links if you want to check out some of the music that they might have listened to from what we've discovered. And you can also see the detail. Um, one of the things that the Etruscans are known for is their exquisite bronze sculptures and artifacts that show their craftsmanship and skill working in this metal. So just as a reminder of where we've come from and trying to connect how the Etruscans, the Greeks, and the Romans would have all really had an influence on each other via their philosophies, of course, trading all sorts of goods from spices to um, all different types of metal, obviously artworks. And I just want to acknowledge that we've, we've studied the art of the Aegeans, which really was you know, mostly around the um, islands and the different belief systems of the Minoans that you guys uh, considered and the Mycenaeans. And then we moved on and we learned about Greece and the Greeks and how much they had a lot of military force and um, how the Greeks kind of grew out of the Aegeans and the folks that we studied on the islands. And now we're considering how the Etruscans really influenced the Romans and that the Romans really wouldn't have a lot of the famous art and architecture that they're known for without these other influences from specifically the Etruscans and the Greeks who were actually all living at the same time and like I said, doing a lot of trade. So I'd like for you to take a minute and watch this really awesome introductory video. It's only about six minutes long that gives you a good foundation of what I'm talking about. So the Etruscan civilization um, is kind of a mysterious one that you'll get from the different videos that you're going to be watching. And it was roughly um, in the Tuscany, Tuscany part of Italy. And it was a very wealthy civilization because of the soil, which was very fertile, and the abundance of metal ore. And so these were people that, um, similar to the Minoans, were doing things a little differently at this particular time period. And so, you know, they, the Etruscans ruled Rome for a while before the Romans, you know, took over and made the history and historical marks that they made. They were exceptional with metalworking and terracotta, which is a form of ceramics and wall paintings. And also the Etruscan women had a lot more power than their Greek counterparts. And that shows up in the different things that we've been able to uncover. The Etruscan language is a bit more mysterious. Um, it's similar to the Greek script, but it's not exactly the same and it's not as though the influence came from the Greeks. It's just they can recognize the scholars who are trying to decipher the Etruscan language can recognize similar um, like the the way that the words might infer something when they're comparing the two languages. And so there's this parallel, but they haven't been able to actually completely decipher the language, which is really unfortunate because it, it's a, it appears that the Etruscans were a special civilization and that they did have a lot of rich literature. Most of it was destroyed and lost um, due to the Romans taking over and trying to wipe out any of the historical significance that the Etruscans had. So then people just think that the Romans kind of built all of the ideas on their own. But the Etruscans did have a language and they did have stories and there is a little bit of written uh, records, but not enough to be able to really decipher exactly where they came from 
and what their actual influence was on our on humankind's history. But here you can see um, an inscription temple. These are, you know, something that would have been a lot of the um, languages found on tombs and or and or contracts and things like that. And so here you can see that there's definitely they had a language. We can only decipher aspects of it. Oh, and I'd also like for you to take a minute to watch another required video because I really hope that you get a sense of this these special people. Um, the trust in government was similar to the Greeks in the sense that um, they were ruled by a king, but then they would have the city-states, and so the city-states would be able to kind of have their own laws, not specifically, but um, it's definitely uh, the foundation of our own uh, pers government in, the, in North America. And so you can kind of see they would have had some sort of coinage that they think might have mostly been used for paying soldiers, um, not so much for trade, but again, like we're not really sure. It could have also been used in trade. Um, and that these city-states, even though they were kind of governed by the main city, which changed o over time because we're talking about you know, we're looking at about a 700 time period that the Etruscans would have been a fairly established civilization. Um, but the, so the city-states from time to time would go into war trying to see who could become like the main city or the capital, so to speak. Um, they did have strong religious beliefs. And like the Greeks, they were worshiping many gods and goddesses. Um, and there was also a lot of according to what's been discovered, kind of an interesting mythology around how they would have used um, a device like this in sacrificing of an animal and then deciphering um, from the entrails and you know through the rituals some sort of um, what might be coming in the future or uh, how they were relating the, in a positive or negative way with the different gods that they worshiped. And so it's interesting again to think about, you know, there was just a certain amount of people who would be able to decipher these secrets or rituals and they were usually scholared priests and or um, noblemen who had worked their way up, obviously being very educated. The Etruscans had a very strong military. Um, and you can see by some of the images that I collected, you know, this is just a, an illustration of what they think that the um, warriors or military would have been wearing. Um, it's interesting to think about how heavy some of these materials would have been that they would have had to carry during some sort of a combat. There was a lot of raiding going on between the city states and or coming into the different other territories specifically with the Greeks when the Etruscans were at their height of their civilization. And they would sacrifice their prisoners. Uh, There's a lot of bloodshed definitely during this time. And they believe that the sacrifice of these prisoners from the Etruscans probably led into some of the gladiatorial entertainments that we see and you'll learn about in the Roman amphitheaters. Not a lot. It's, hard, it's, it's kind of hard to distinguish some of the Etruscan architecture from some of the Roman architecture, but this particular Port Augustina is something that's specifically um, related to the Etruscans, and it shows some of the influence and uh, strong relationship between how the Etruscans really sort of started the foundation for the Roman Empire. And so you can see the use of the arch, which we see a lot in the Romans, and also just the way that they were making these very war, uh, war <laughs> having a hard time saying this word, um, how they would use the similar type of um, large scale, massive walls that would create these guarded cities. Um, 
and again for protection from invading people who would be coming to try and take over. The Etruscan temples are similar to some of the things that we've seen with the Greek styles. They didn't quite use the same type of column structures um, and there was more of an open porch as opposed to a lot of the Greeks had more of the inner courtyards. But you can still see some of the similarities. And another difference is that um, they had their deities on the roofs of the structures, which was much different than the Greeks. And so it's interesting to think about the influence that these cultures would have had, because they would have interacted with each other for a good two, three, maybe 400 years, so an, an extended period of time. This is a great video that I'd like for you to take a minute to watch so you can learn about a little bit more about the Etruscans and why their deities or why we think their deities might have been on the roof and some of the symbolism behind their deities. The Twelve Labors was a really important story. A lot of the, I guess, like how you would behave as a good person in the Etruscan society and also in the Greek society was through the mythology and the stories that were handed down. And so the Twelve Labors was something about being a good person and, and again, like placing these different gods in these positions of making choices about, you know, who might get um, a great life or the farming that they needed or the education or whatever different aspects the individual might have been pursuing. And so I think it's interesting to think about how important the mythology was at this particular time in history. And then just to kind of compare and contrast, which you could also apply to an essay paper where you're looking at these two civilizations that had a similarity in the way that they um, created their temples, but also had a lot of differences that I was already discussing, how they used the sort of porch or courtyard concept where the deities were placed in a very different way and you know potentially then in your essay you could write about what you discover through your research as to the speculation as to why they were similar but also very different. The Etruscan tombs is where we find a lot of the artifacts and kind of piece together some of the beliefs and what these the civilization would have been focusing on at this time and so the tomb paintings were believed to be a decoration in a way to honor the um, deceased and giving them this belief that there was a good afterlife um, and that this journey into this unknown world would be pleasant and so they would find goods and jewelry and dinner sets kind of anything that you would need almost in your everyday life and so you can see here in the painting there's musicians and people bringing gifts and food and the individuals are being served by servants. Remember in this time period, most people in the higher um, class system, so the nobles, the priests who would have been able to afford these larger tombs reclined when they were eating so they would you know, be comfortable while they were eating and they would be served. And so you see that in the paintings found this is a great example of what these tombs would have looked like. This is obviously hasn't been reconstructed, so it's in a little bit more of a raw state. But you, it, again, it strongly inf it it connects their religion and their afterlife that were very important um, aspects of the Etruscan art. And you can see it's almost like a these tombs that they discovered, similar to the Egyptians, but different yet still similar because they probably, they also would have been interacting at the same time and certain people would have migrated and done trade um, with the Egyptians. And so it's interesting to think how all these different cultures would have been influencing each other. So again, I'd like for you to go ahead and watch this where it talks specifically about the burial chamber and the different aspects of how these rooms were really like a room you would find in a house. Just more examples of these paintings that you would find um, in these different tombs that were specifically created to 
create this happy, fulfilling afterlife. Um, and that there would be feasting and dancing and hunting and swimming and, you know, all the normal activities that they would have done um, when they were in their human body uh, before going uh, into the afterlife. A lot of gold was found in these tombs. And so you can see again the skills that the craftsmanship would have had to create these beautiful um, artifacts and kind of thinking about, you know, again, we're just making up like the sometimes um, the bodies could have been found encased in kind of these gold suits again to help prolong and, and, and have a safe journey into the afterlife. The sarcophagus, which would have been similar to a coffin, you might have just found the, like an urn inside with ashes. Sometimes you would have found um, the actual corpse or mummified corpse, not exactly like what you find in Egypt, but similar. But what's important to note is now the way that the um, Etruscans were creating these depictions of people. So they're lounging, which meant they were potentially maybe at a feast or some sort of celebration because they might have been eating. You can see by the gestures of their hands that they were holding something. If you watch this video, they'll talk about the significance of potentially a pomegranate. Some people feel that she was holding an egg, which would have symboled fertility. So it's hard to know, but it definitely from their expression, it's very inviting. These um, sculptures are very gestural and the details to be able to walk around to see the back and the front also just shows the artisan's um, dedication to depicting the individual to then be um, beautiful in the afterlife. And I just thought it would be interesting again, trying to point out the, all the different things that you could potentially write to do a comparison. And so you could compare some of the sculptures from the early Egyptian time to the sarco sarcophagus and just the rigidness of the way that this couple is posed compared to the more, I don't know if I want to say playfulness, but the more inviting way that this particular couple is represented. So what are they doing? How are they portrayed? And then what is the purpose of these two sculptures? Those are things that you could potentially write about. And then to compare, um, if you wanted to, another thing to compare that's more connected in a closer time span would have been the Etruscans and the Greeks. And these are two different funerary artifacts. Um, and again, the different ways that these couples or these relationships between men and women are being depicted. Um, this looks like they're, you know, very intimately connected. And here there's definitely a different type of relationship between the man and the woman. So there's a lot of interesting ways that you could approach doing a comparison and contrast. Or you could just stick with focusing on the Etruscan society and write an interesting essay around how these different Etruscan funerary artifacts really expose and, and visually represent the relationships that were happening at that particular time in that society. And then finally, um, just to note, so of course the Etruscans had really developed a very sophisticated way of casting and engraving with bronze, and so they were known for that, and that's one of the reasons why it was such a lucrative culture because they could trade with other cultures that didn't have the skills and or necessarily the access to this particular type of metal. And so here, this is one of the more famous sculptures. Supposedly, um, first the she-wolf was created and then later, maybe in around 800 CE, or I'm sorry, much later in the 15th century, I'm looking at my notes wrong, um, the two boys that are supposed to have symbolized the founders of Rome suckling on the breasts of, you know, what would have been created by an Etruscan artist. So there's an interesting symbolism around the way that this uh, artifact has sort of been um, recreated to make kind of a connection, a very strong connection between the Etruscans and the Romans. 
And then of course here's a bunch of helpful hints. So that gives you an introduction to the Etruscans and kind of shows you some of the artifacts that have been discovered. Thank you for listening.